seriously, I really do have the longest arms. I was in a pageant one time, and they had us um, go back with the judges for a critique to tell you what you could improve. And this judge leaned across the table at me, and she goes, I don't mean to be rude, but your arms are so long. <laughs> this is supposed to be a critique, something I can fix. I'm like, what do you want me to do? Go like this? <laughs> like, and so I was really happy when the movie first came out because now I have somebody I can identify with. I am Elastigirl. I can reach every shelf in my kitchen without a stool. <laughs> you know, you got to have something to brag about, right? <laughs> we all have our thing, don't we? Oh, I'm so happy to see you. I love hearing you worship. And I love to share little things to help us be better sisters. So I've taught us before, you know, if your sister has something in her teeth, you got to tell her. And I've taught you about spanks and some different things. So our little sisterhood lesson for this evening. As I was getting ready, I was trying to get my eyebrows. Now, I don't know about you, but my eyebrows are uneven. One is higher than the other. My right arm is longer, my left foot is bigger, my left eyebrow is higher. I'm trying to get my eyebrows <laughs> fixed. And I had eyebrow gel, trying to get them to stay in place, and they just wouldn't. And so I finally got them how I thought I wanted. So I decided instead of trying to do more gel, I'd just take the hairspray. <laughs> okay, I, this is, I don't recommend this. Because all night now, my eyelashes are sticking to each other. <laughs> so that's our little sisterhood helpful lesson Helpful tips from Pastor Tamra. <laughs> Do not spray your eyelashes. <laughs> oh, okay, before I go into my message, please, before we get any farther into this weekend, I want to say thank you to so many people. I actually typed all their names out on the paper and decided after I did that that I probably shouldn't read them all because I will just torture you with the number of people involved in making this weekend happen. But I do want to say thank you to the Quest Dance Studio and all those precious dancers that we had with our worship team. Thank you, thank you, thank you to our sisterhood event team. Lori Fredrickson is my administrative assistant, and she is the best. Melinda Abston is our volunteer assistant director. She gives... Basically, she works a full-time job at the crossing and a full-time job to make money. So she serves you with her whole heart, along with 13 other ladies on our sisterhood event team. Our tech and media guys are here tonight doing the stage, the sound, the cameras, all the pre-production of videos, just amazing men of God. Our worship team, of course, with Pastor John, Pastor Caleb will be here tomorrow, and all of our wonderful singers. I was going to, literally, I was going to give you every name, but I'm not going to. And then when I think about just making this event happen, literally every department at church is involved in some way. Some way, shape, or form, whether it's Jenny with First Impressions or our children's ministry that are watching children now, we have the most amazing church. And I'm so thankful for everybody that was a part of making this weekend happen. So thank you, thank you, thank you. How about we pray and get going here? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> each work, the each year, the anticipation just grows and grows and grows to the point that we just want to explode with excitement. And so that my tigger has been coming out. But we just thank you that we get to come worship you, learn about you and from you and your word. Thank you for Megan coming to share her wisdom and depth. And um, I just believe she is a deep well that is going to be poured out on us. And we're so thankful. So I just pray now in these few minutes that I have that I will disappear and that the women will receive exactly what you intend for them to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so I'm a huge note taker, so that's why I always give you, either I give you a journal or I give you something that you can take notes in. So pull out, I even gave you a pen, so you have no excuses. You have to take notes, probably even more with Megan than with me, because you hear me all the time, I think. But anyway, um, 
as I was looking, like last year, at the end of last year, I'm already praying about what the theme is going to be for the next year. So we were already starting the planning. I thought I knew what the theme was. And then on December 20th, we were in the our noon prayer, for our Wednesday noon prayer service, and Pastor Fiona was speaking, and she started talking about greater and experiencing the greater things of God. And I was like, holy cow, that is what God wants us to focus on at conference. So we changed everything. We started from scratch, and the Lord led me to Ephesians 3.20. I marked it and won't be able to get it to it now. Oh, seriously. Ephesians 3.20, now to him who is able to do immeasurably, exceedingly, abundantly, more than we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory to the church and to Jesus Christ throughout all generations, forever and ever, amen. Exceedingly abundantly, immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine is what he wants to do in our lives. And um, Greg just actually preached a sermon this last week where he used this verse and we got home. I was like, that's my verse for conference. He's like, I didn't even know that. And what he had us do in services, he told all of us when we got home, when you go home, write down what you think is greater than what you can imagine that God could do in your life. Did anybody do your homework? I'm going to get on. I'm going to tell on you if you didn't. You can still do it before Sunday or Saturday night, whichever service you go to. Well, what I wrote is that I really want to see this sisterhood conference sold out at this campus so that we have to also have it at our South Shore campus. And then we're launching our Plant City campus next year. So we would have, I want, that is, that is what I see as God doing immeasurably more than I can ask or imagine. So if I define it that way, then that means God has even more because it's more than we can ask or imagine, right? Yes. Oh, God is so good. He's doing such incredible things at the crossing. We had our staff meeting yesterday, and we just went around the staff and asked, you know, what, what's happening in your department. And we heard all kinds of, we've had over 200 couples go through our marriage conference. Last weekend, we had, um, a, oh, okay, so we had eight weeks of intercessory prayer training where 70 people went through eight weeks. I mean, that is a huge commitment. Every week for eight weeks, two Saturdays that were like six hours long, like huge commitment. And then we had the um, over 200 couples at the marriage retreat. Then we had over 100 people last weekend at Group Link sign up to be in a life group. God is doing such great things at the crossing. I can hardly keep myself together about it. In October, there's actually two pages in your conference book about Revive Florida. And we are coming together not just as the crossing church, but as churches all around the community to actually get little short training sessions and then go out into the community and share Jesus and then come back to the churches in the area in the evenings to celebrate and share testimonies of salvation. It's going to be amazing. And I hear all those things, all of these great things happening in our church and all these great things that are about to happen in our city. And I just want to remind you, God wants to do great things in you as an individual and in me as an individual. So what, what kind of greater things are you after? What are you thinking about right now? Is it a greater faith? Is it a greater presence? Is it greater healing or greater freedom? Is it greater discernment or wisdom? I bet if we went around the room, each of us would have something different. But that's what's so great about our God because he comes and meets us as individuals. And he has something so great for you. And so as I prayed for this and about this event, the Lord led me to King David. So I'm just going to give you a synopsis of 1 Samuel 16 and 17. Yes, 16 and 17, instead of like reading this big, long story to you. Many of you have probably heard the story of David and Goliath. You've probably read those little children's Bible stories to your children. Um, so I'm just going to give you the synopsis and then pull out four things that really stuck out to me. First of all, Saul was the king of Israel, and he was not chosen by God. He was chosen by the people, so he was really not, he was not God's guy for the job. And he was not, God was not very happy with Saul either. 
So God tells Samuel, who is the high priest, that he wants him to go to Bethlehem, and he's going to show him who he's chosen as king, and he wants Samuel to anoint him with oil as the king of Israel. So Samuel obeys. He goes to Bethlehem. God leads him to the house of Jesse, and Jesse calls his sons, and one by one, Samuel keeps thinking, this must be the one, and every time God says no, and after he gets through seven sons, he says to Jesse, is this it? Do you have any other sons? And he said, oh, well, I have one more, but he's the youngest, and he's the smallest, and he's out in the field taking care of the sheep. And Samuel says, please have him come. So David comes, and immediately God tells Samuel, he is the one, anoint him. So David was about, we think, 16 years old when he was anointed by Samuel as king of Israel. But what does he do? He goes back out in the field and takes care of the sheep because that was his job. At the same time, God had removed his blessing and spirit from the king Saul, and he sent a tormenting spirit. So Saul was just beside himself. His life was miserable. And one of his people recommends that he have someone come play the harp to help him feel better whenever he's experiencing this torment. So David gets called to come and play the harp for King Saul. Well, King Saul falls in love with David. He thinks he's amazing. He has no idea he's been an anointed king because that was That took place just in their hometown in secret. And so David is now traveling back and forth. He serves the king, plays the harp. Then he goes home and serves his dad and takes care of the sheep. Okay? So now we're kind of caught up here. We get to chapter 17, and the Israelites have gone to war against the Philistines. Now, we just got to go to Israel back in May, and I scoured through my pictures trying to figure out how I could show you pictures and help you understand. It's the most amazing thing. Please save your money and come with us next time because we will go again, and it is life-changing. Um, so there, there's this valley, and the Philistines are on one side up the hill, and the Israelites are on the other side. Well, Jesse calls his son David out of the field and says, I need you to go to the front lines where your brothers are serving with Saul in battle, and I need you to take this food to them. Give this food to your brothers, give this food to the commanding officer, and then, you know, come back home. So Jesse's expecting his son to go run this errand and then come back. I mean, run this errand, please. You should see this landscape. They didn't have cars. I mean, it's incredible how they had to travel and how long it took and how far things were. Anyway, um, (laughs) so he goes, and David gets there, and all of the Israelite soldiers are, like, terrified. They're all just frozen in fear, and he finds out there is this guy, Goliath, who is a champion warrior, and he's nine feet tall, and two times a day for 40 days, he stood on the other side and just taunted the Israelite army, threatening them, making fun of them, making fun of their God, and it just infuriated David. In verse uh, chapter 17, verse 24, um, it specifically says, and this just stuck out at me, that when the Israelites saw the man, Goliath, they all ran from him in great fear and it stuck out at me because of the word great, they all experienced this great fear, but David wasn't afraid. In verse 26, he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And right after that, his own brother turns around and totally tells him, like, shut your face, basically. Like, who are you, and why are you talking, and why did you leave those few sheep? Because shepherds were not respected. It was not seen as an important job. It was a menial job. He was the youngest. He was the smallest. He was a shepherd. And his brother already knows he's anointed as king, but he doesn't want to admit that, obviously. So he treats his younger brother super ugly, and what does David do? He just turns his back on him. And starts asking questions of the other people, and then he tells everyone, because they're standing there terrified. He tells everyone, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. The littlest, youngest, smallest little 16-year-old that hasn't been through any training, he's going to go fight him. So Saul finds out and wants to see David. So David goes to see Saul, King Saul, I should say. And King Saul um, says, you can't. You can't do this. You're so young. You're just a boy. You haven't been trained. And here's what David says. Let me get to the right spot. In verse 34, we're in chapter 17, verse 34. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. 
When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by the hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defiled the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul's like, oh, okay, go ahead. (laughs) Go, go, go. You go right ahead because Saul was too afraid. But then Saul's like, wait, hang on one second. Take my armor. So he puts on all this heavy armor, probably bigger even than David was. So it's heavy, it's big, it's awkward. David's never worn it before. And he's like, no, this isn't going to work. He takes it off. He says, I can't do that. I'm not going to do that. He takes his little shepherd's bag, his five smooth stones, his sling, and his shepherd's staff, and he heads down to the front lines. In verse 45, David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, who you have defied. This day, the Lord will hand you over to me and I will strike you down, cut off your head. Today, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth and the whole world will know there is a God in Israel. All those gathered there will know that, there, that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. And he literally runs toward Goliath, swings that, what's the word? Slingshot and kills Goliath. Goliath comes tumbling down, and the rest of the Philistine army goes running away. And David experiences this great victory, right? But so other than this great victory, let's go back up. What did, what did David experience that was greater? Well, it started out in the fields. He experienced a greater presence of the Lord because he spent that time out there worshiping him. And we know that because he wrote all these psalms that are in this Bible for us. So just one example in Psalm 8, David says, and it's, it's fun to go read the Psalms because it'll literally say, author David, a song of David. And it'll give you a little, like get a, a life application study Bible. It gives you all kinds of little notes about who wrote it and why they wrote it and what period of time it was. So here in Psalm 8, David says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. He experienced greater presence. He was in the presence of God. Second, he experienced greater faith. He, even when he went, when he saw a lion or a bear taking an animal, one of his sheep, he didn't run out in his own strength and fight this animal. He believed that God was the one that delivered him from the animals, and it was God that was going to deliver him from the giant. He had greater faith and confidence. He knew, he believed God's faithfulness, so he had a greater faith faith, and confidence. He also had a greater identity because when Saul tried to give him his armor, he was like, this is not me. I don't don't belong in this. I'm going to go do what I'm being called to do, and I'm going to do it as me, not trying to be someone else. He had a greater identity, and he experienced a greater reward. So not only did he get to kill Goliath and have this incredible victory, but then he actually did become the king of Israel. What great reward is that? So when you hear this story, does it get you excited? It gets me ready. I'm ready to go kill a giant. (laughs) Because it isn't me, right? It's God. And each of us can and will experience the greater things of God. But what is required? What do we do? How many of you say, I want to experience the greater things of God? Almost everybody. I'm just kidding. (laughs) So first, we have to have action. We have to take action. And that action is getting 
into the word of God, getting into the presence of God, learning to hear his voice, recognizing his voice. The Bible says, my sheep will know my voice. But we won't know his voice if we aren't in his presence. Think about David in the fields with the sheep. If he was never in the field with the sheep and then all of a sudden he walks out into the field and calls them, are they going to answer? No, they're not going to know his voice. We are God's sheep. And we will know his voice by spending time with him and being in his word and recognizing his voice. Second thing, we've got to obey. We have to do what God tells us even if it doesn't make sense, even if we can't see the big picture, and even if it doesn't seem like it's even attached to something greater. Do you really think that when David obeyed his father by taking food to his brothers and the commanding officer, that he ever imagined that this very unimportant, simple job would lead him into this encounter where he gets to kill a giant? Would you have thought that? No. So are, how many of us are doing things right now in our lives that we think of as like small or unimportant or not? I mean, all that time David spent out in the fields, nobody was watching him. Nobody was paying attention to how faithful he was being, taking care of the sheep. How many of us feel like we're doing things right now that nobody is noticing? And maybe we think, this isn't going anywhere. Why am I doing this? I am telling you, and I promise you, God uses every single thing to prepare you for what he has that is greater. I promise. Romans 8, 28 says, all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. It does not say all things are good. It says all things work for good. So even if you're in experiencing something right now that isn't a good circumstance, you can know, you can trust his word that says it will be used for good. So let me ask, how many of you want to experience the greater things of God? Very good. How many of you would say you think you might know or have an idea of what that greater thing might be? Stand up. Stand up if you think you might know. I mean, remember, he's going to do exceedingly and abundantly more than we can even ask or imagine. So this is just sort of like just for fun because he's really the one that knows. Okay, so if you don't have any idea what your greater might be, stand up. And then everybody in the room should be standing because there's only two choices. You either kind of know or you don't know at all. None of us really know. None of us really know. Because he gives us his word as a lamp into our feet and a light into our path, which really means only about this far ahead. We don't get to see the whole big picture. We really don't. So we just have to be active in his presence. We have to be obedient when he tells us what he wants us to do, right? And then trust him, trust him, trust him, trust him so we can experience greater things. Let me pray for you. Jesus, thank you so much for these ladies. Thank you, God, that you have something greater for each one of us, exceedingly, abundantly, immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. God, help us to trust you. Help us to trust you as we walk it out, as we take the action, as we act in obedience, God. Lead us in that path. Keep our path straight. Lead us into the greatness that you have for us. Speak, Lord. Speak to those who need a word tonight. One word, one picture, maybe even a whole phrase, but I pray you speak. And if he speaks to you, write it down so you don't forget. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. We worship you. We worship you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And was that okay? Do you want to experience greater things of God? I guess I didn't give you guys a whole bunch of chances to, like, talk back to me this time. I don't know. I was very serious. I was very right, left-brained this time. Remember, we're learning about brain health at the crossing. So when you're greeting your sisters tonight, remember to look in their left eye.
Remember how we practiced that before? Their left eye is connected to the right side, the emotional side of their brain. So you're going to build joy in your sisters here tonight by looking in their left eye. You're going to feel like, if you're not used to it, you're going to feel like you're reading their mail at the deepest core of their soul. Because it's really weird when you first start. But it's so good. So I want you to practice all weekend. <laughs> Boy, I got everybody giggling that time, didn't I? Okay, wait, wait. One more thing. I'm losing you. I'm losing you. Okay, so every year at all of our sisterhood events, we support one of our local ministries. In your booklet, we have a list of all the different ministries that as your life group, you can go serve. As an individual, you can go serve. Those are the, the organizations that we support. And so this um, event, we are going to focus on a ministry called Sela. So we're going to watch a video about them right now. And then tomorrow, you'll actually get to hear a bunch more, see another video, and we will actually take up an offering. So as you watch this video tonight and as you go home this evening, please pray about what the Lord would have you give and then be prepared tomorrow to give that offering. Of course, there will be that online stuff. You know, you can bring a check if you want to. But... There will be all the online giving and everything, too, as well. So um, let's take a look at this little video we have. <laughs> 